Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan, and yes, this is a professional piece of audio equipment. This is not a dirty sock, and also, uh, Yo Soy Batman. Most people believe that Emperor Palpatine's entire grand plan was just focused on destroying the Jedi, the hated enemy of the Sith. The truth is, that's just one part of Palpatine's own personal plan. Old Pappy McShorten Face wasn't exactly a company man. He's more like a ruthless, independent contractor. And today, I want to talk about his true intentions with the galaxy, what he was actually after. Taking a page out of a 4X video game, Palpatine was not only after a spiritual or religious victory against the Jedi sect, he was also after an industrial and economic victory. A complete industrial and economic victory. Palpatine was a rule of two Sith, which means he comes from a long line of Sith Lords, starting with Darth Bane almost a thousand years earlier. The rule of two Sith were kind of different from every other dark side organization that came before them. Darth Bane recognized the greatness weakness of the dark side. The Sith's inability to cooperate with one another and compete properly against the Jedi and their immensely rich and powerful Republic backers. And so to decrease the more savage and oftentimes destructive power competition that was so natural amongst the Sith circles, Bane limited the Sith's numbers to just two at a time. The idea was for the Sith to be forced to hide in the shadows and gather resources plotting until they were ready to rise up and destroy the Republic. Darth Bane correctly identified the main problem with the Sith, but he naively believed that the rule of two order Sith were going to be that different and were going to be willing to basically sacrifice our entire life for a greater good that will outlive them. It's actually a miracle the rule of two Sith survived as long as it did. There were actually a lot of chaotic individuals who threw some wrenches into Darth Bane's plan. I mean, there was one uh, Sith Lord that believed he needed to go to the light side, and so he started destroying a lot of the... Uh, information and knowledge that the Sith Rule of Two Order had collected. I guess basing your entire order on just having two members at a time is a severe oversight because that means your order can be quickly destroyed. Now, Darth Plagueis and Darth Sidious represented the beginning of the end for the Rule of Two Sith. Darth Plagueis had discovered a way to become immortal, a process that required two Sith Lords. He wanted to create a pact with his apprentice, Darth Sidious, in which two Sith Lords would keep each other alive indefinitely. This, of course, went against the rule of two Sith tradition of the apprentice killing the master after learning all of the secrets and lessons he had to teach. Plague has also underestimated just how vicious and power-hungry his student was. And so when the moment presented itself, Darth Sidious would just take Plague life. Screw this uh, co-op, let's revive each other indefinitely plan, which actually is kind of a good plan if you're a rational, logical person, which, you know, Darth Sidious definitely was not. Darth Sidious was not interested in continuing the rule of two Sith in any shape or form. He never taught his apprentices as equals. He never taught them everything they needed to know to defeat him. I think he was completely against that idea. He probably thought it was stupid, and it, you know, it kind of is if you are into self-preservation. Instead, Darth Sidious, and you know, like most employers, used their underlings. He used everyone for the sole purpose of advancing his own power. He didn't care much about the legacy of the Sith beyond how they could help him acquire more power. This is the era of the rule of one, and Palpatine was more or less on top of this pyramid all by himself. You know, a lot of psychopaths in our own world are also multi-level marketing advocates. Now, one of the more interesting byproducts of the rule of two era Sith was the Sith order shift from being a large near-peer adversary to the Jedi, who were extremely militant and aggressive and destructive, to basically becoming a secret order, an exile. This forced the Sith to adopt a much more subtle way of doing business uh, and made them kind of sit back, essentially control their emotions to a certain extent, which is really not Sith-like, and think about what they're doing before just acting. The Sith were outnumbered and, and hunted at this point until the Jedi basically forgot about them, and this really made the Sith more ruthless, careful, and creative. Instead of trying to directly confront the Republic through military action, which never turned out you know, well for the Sith Empire, which was a lot smaller, had less resources and manpower. The Rule of Two Sith realized that the Republic was an open system. Everyone had the right to be great and powerful. You only just had to follow the Republic's code. Capitalism. You know, if you understand the economic system and the political system that both were tied together very intimately, especially during the late Republic stage, you could basically have unlimited amounts of power. This was completely different for the Sith. I mean, the Sith Empire was just a militant political order that ruled more through conquest and show of force. The problem with Sith armies, as you know, robust as they were, they usually ran out of you know food to eat, resources to 
fuel their forges, stuff like that. The Republic was more of a mercantile faction that attracted new territories thanks to its robust trading capital markets. Its weapons of choice were not battleships and super lasers, but economic policies like sanctions, tariffs, and regulations. And so the rule of two Sith weren't as focused on acquiring super weapons, battleships, and legions of warriors anymore. This was the new Sith, and the new Sith were all about collecting assets, political figures, companies, aka wealth and capital. Basically, the Sith decided, you know, let's do this right, let's go legit. Instead of acting like a bunch of savages going around raiding and pillaging, you know, punching babies and eating endangered species. Let's raid and pillage using hedge funds and political lobbies. You know, socially acceptable crimes against humanity. It's crazy how if you just put on a suit and tie and go around uh, robbing and shanking people, that as long as you get enough people rich and continue to provide results, you can basically do whatever you want. It's far more acceptable than doing the same thing, but as an open Sith Lord. And so by the time Rugus Gnome, aka Darth Tenebris, the master of Plagueis, was around, the Rule of Two Sith had acquired an impressive portfolio of assets. You know, each Sith Lord that picked up the mantle of the Rule of Two, you know, had their own little pizzazz that they added to the wider organization. Tenebris, as his public-facing persona, Rigus Gnome, had become a famous shipbuilder whose work was so in demand that only the richest and most famous clientele were given a chance to fly one of his ships. This allowed Darth Tenebris to effortlessly pass through the elite circles of the galaxy, you know, the politicians, the industrialists, the people who truly ran and shaped how the galaxy worked. Tenebris also had a very robust network of informant spies and agents working for him that could alter the situations behind the scenes once he figured out who was doing what. This entire network and group of associates were all inherited by Darth Plagueis when he killed his master. Now, Tenebris was a bith. He was extremely calculating and intelligent. He didn't just choose Higo Damask, aka Darth Plagueis, by accident. He actually pre-planned the creation of his Mune apprentice. He basically took a female Mune who was very Force-sensitive and had her seduce a mid-level executive in the IGBC known as Kar Damask. Together, they would have a child who was immensely powerful in the Force, but also have a familial connection to high-ranking members in the intergalactic banking clan. Well, actually, Kar Damask wasn't initially high-ranking, but the Sith, through you know their network of spies and, and other figures, managed to pull a few strings and he started to rise up in the ranks. This was an important step for the Sith Grand Plan. You know, the Republic throughout its history had a relatively weak central government. They didn't even have a Federal Reserve or any type of treasury, as far as we know. Instead, it was the intergalactic banking clan, a huge conglomerate of hundreds if not thousands of different banks that controlled the currency and interest rates in the galaxy. They're kind of the ones who created most of the monetary policy unless the Senate occasionally stepped in and passed a law or a restriction here or there. There was kind of a balance of power between the Senate and these private banks. It's it's kind of crazy if you think about it. But anyway, if you control the IGBC, you control the majority of financing and everything else connected to the banking system, which of course gives you immense amounts of power. Darth Lakers would create the powerful organization known as Damask Holdings, a lobbying group and also fund that would essentially be the center of Sith activities in the last few years of the Republic. And so while Darth Tenebris was you know, socializing and talking with the elites. Darth Plagueis, as he go Damask, was literally purchasing companies and purchasing politicians. He had become a puppeteer of the elites. And so when Darth Sidious took over the rule of two Sith, what he was after was not just the destruction of the Jedi Order. If anything, he saw that as just another faction, another nuisance that he needed to get rid of. A particularly dangerous faction, to be fair. What Palpatine was actually after was the complete and total control of the economic and financial might of the Republic. This was actually the root of the Jedi Order's true power, if you think about it. They and the Republic were an unstoppable force. And the Sith actually thought the Jedi were really weak for not taking more advantage of how much the Republic seemed to trust this monastic order. And so while many other Sith Lords saw their assets and resources as weapons to destroy the Jedi, Palpatine wanted all of those resources and assets to carve out an internal empire. His grand ambition is what really set him apart from the other rule of two Sith, who I guess were mostly, you know, a part of this larger vision that uh, would outlast their own lives. Palpatine was like, no, the buck ends here. I'm going to harvest all of this hard-earned resources and connections and use it 
to take my shot. Now, the problem that Palpatine faced was actually quite interesting. Whether he was Supreme Chancellor or even the newly appointed Emperor of the Galactic Empire, his power is still kind of limited. I mean, he was beholden to the opinions of the public. And also, there was a core group of elite individuals in the center of the galaxy that basically ran the entire galaxy. Palpatine was just the executive figurehead, and he needed to slowly gather and gather more power into the federal government. But remember, the Republic was very weak when it came to its central government. And so this took time. The reality is, while the transition of the Galactic Empire was tolerated by the galaxy, Palpatine still had to tread lightly with his policy and how quickly he enacted change. He couldn't just blow up Alderaan right after uh, taking out the Republic. He needed to wait for like 20 years and build up a case wait for Bail Organa to, you know, create weapon stocks on the planet, stuff like that. And no matter how much political power he had in the galaxy, the galaxy's economic and industrial might remained quite elusive to him. You know, the Republic, even at the end of the Clone War, still had that weak central government we keep talking about. And that was problematic because Palpatine had his own grand plan, a huge vision of a galactic-wide order that also featured a unified military-industrial complex that could build a military an extremely large scale for an extremely low cost because of the economies of scale. This would involve the complete nationalization of several planets of resources, uh, corporations, and also finding a lot of friendly corporations with CEOs and chairmen that are aligned with imperial values. Now, the Republic's economy in the last centuries of its existence was quite fragmented. In every major industry, there were several large mega conglomerates. You could say that there was definitely the existence of oligopolies. But truth be told, the galaxy was way too large. Uh, the various species and cultures were too diverse, and there were just a lot of different needs, a lot of specialization in places for companies to innovate. And so galactic-wide monopolies were quite rare in any industry. And so there are all these smaller operators running around, like take the Starship manufacturing industry, for instance, an area I've spent thousands of hours researching for various investments I've made personally in the Galactic Stock Exchange. There are dozens of major players, like Quad Drive Yards, Senior Fleet Systems, and Krillin Engineering Corporation that all specialize in a different type of ship. KDY, with its massive shipyards, focus on capital ships that are generally a mile or longer. Brilliant Engineering Corporation has the civilian freighter market completely cornered, and Senior Fleet Systems is basically being carried by those sweet government contracts for starfighters with the Empire. Right Senior loves sucking on some Imperial teeth. But these larger companies also face robust competition from below. For instance, Horsch and Kessel used to be a much larger player back in the day and no longer was really that competitive, except for one model it produced, the LH3010 Capital Freighter, one of the more popular bulk freighter models used specifically in the Outer Rim. The point is, you know, antitrust regulation, you know, actions by the Senate, uh, the sheer diversity uh, of what the galaxy needs, including the size of the galaxy, meant that, yeah, you had room for all sorts of different types of businesses. This is why the Republic was so powerful. It had a really robust free market, relatively free market. Now, Palpatine wanted the exact opposite. He wanted a monopoly. He didn't want competition. He doesn't want market economics and employees having any leverage on his production facilities. He wants a single focused industrial body run by the government, where the labor ideally is slaves, prisoners, or droids, aka very low cost. He also wants raw resources that are nationalized and the only cost there is extraction. Palpatine wanted everything, but unfortunately, uh, during the late Republic, period, it was extremely hard to just collect everything and, and kind of bundle it together inside of the government. Remember, we talked about just how fragmented most industries were. There was so much competition and specialization. Palpatine, the Empire, would actually have to organize and consolidate hundreds, if not thousands, of companies uh, with different cultures, supply chains, ways of doing business, and standardize how they worked and operated in order for his dream to come true. You know, luckily for him in the late Republic era, the Sith did something kind of accidentally, which was also very brilliant. The Sith, under the command of Higo Damask and the lobbying groups they controlled already, started pushing all of their major outer rim mega conglomerates to aggressively expand their holdings, in preparation for the Separatist crisis that they were going to basically engineer. The Sith and their wide network of agents made it increasingly easy for these companies to acquire new uh, businesses, and sometimes you know, they would commit corporate espionage, blackmail, or just straight up murder people. Actually, the Trade Federation's entire board was killed in a giant assassination attack, everyone except for Newt Gunright. And then he basically just took over. Stuff like that was just happening 
all the time. And if you take a look at the two centerpieces of the Sith portfolio, the Trade Federation and the Techno Union, both of these massive mega conglomerates that controlled all the shipping, raw resources, harvesting, and industrial manufacturing in the outer rim, started out as trade unions. Uh, these were organizations that you know, took a bunch of medium and small size companies and had them band together so they could actually fight off the large corporations. These two trade unions literally became the very evil they were trying to fight. That's basically how the Sith operated. They twisted and corrupted everything they touched. And it wasn't just the Trade Federation and Techno Union that expanded in size. You also had the IGBC, which we mentioned before, that Higo Damas now had complete control over. There's also the Corporate Alliance, the Hyper Communication Cartel, Commerce Guild, and specific organizations that were species organized, like the Core and Isolation League, and the Geonosian Industries. While these companies and organizations thought they were growing in power thanks to Sith intervention, what was really happening was these groups were being fattened up before getting slaughtered and harvested by Papatine. All these companies that represented the majority of all of the economic output in the Outer Rim started the Confederacy of Pen Systems. At that point, their fates were sealed. They were doomed. Palpatine could very easily just label these individuals as traitors and then just seize all of their assets, and that's exactly what he does. By the end of the Clone Wars, a conflict completely orchestrated and controlled by the Sith, these large mega conglomerates all lost their leadership in a tragic temper tantrum, and soon all of their holdings were nationalized by Emperor Palpatine a simply flawlessly executed plan. Palpatine didn't really have to do much to incorporate these entities into the Empire. These were mega conglomerates that already had an existing command chain and leadership infrastructure in place to look over their countless subsidiaries. Basically, Palpatine had enlisted the free market to seamlessly integrate all of these companies together using market forces. It's a pretty smart move. And so, just a few years into the rise of the Empire, the galaxy's industrial power has all been aligned in mega projects like the Death Star and mass manufacturing efforts like the Imperial Class Star Destroyer and TIE Fighter programs. Emperor Palpatine had seamlessly created the economic engine that would provide steady growth at least in the first few years of the Empire's reign. Of course, with any military first economy, it starts to struggle after a few years because, uh, you know, war isn't exactly an investment. Building giant military force is very expensive, there's a lot of maintenance involved. And that's basically what happened to the Empire, especially as the Galactic Civil War kicked into full speed. And so in a lot of ways, Palpatine kind of squandered all of the careful planning and acquisition made by Sith Lords before him, especially the uh, actions of Darth Plagueis, who really did speed up the size of the Sith's portfolio. In a lot of ways, though, Palpatine destroying the Rule of Two Sith line and then taking all of their gains and resources is exactly what Darth Bane probably wanted him to do. Because Darth Bane also believed in this idea of a Sithari, which was a Sith prophecy that was basically their version of the Jedi Chosen One. Actually, many consider Darth Bane the Sithari. Palpatine's using all that power for himself is ultimately what the Sith were all about. And if you actually take a look at the Rule of Two Sith's history, no Sith Master went to their grave without a struggle. Even Darth Bane fought to the last moment and tried to destroy his apprentice when the time came for him to go. Maybe the Rule of Two Sith it was always designed to be destroyed by a truly worthy individual like Palpatine, who not only understood the power of the Force, but understood the power of politics, economics, and industry, and had a grand vision beyond just eliminating the Jedi. Even though Palpatine ultimately failed to rule for more than two decades, he did achieve a great deal of things in a short reign, including almost completely destroying the Jedi and bringing a sort of balance in this crazy war between the Jedi and Sith. So there you have it guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. I'll see you next time.